All right. Um, peace and blessings, brothers and sisters. Once again, this is the Cosmocentric Mystic. Uh, uh, today, doing a report on early Christianity. Um, so, I think I've already talked about earlier uh, when I was challenged by the Christian brother on uh, Christmas um, about the Jabari Vince Bantu debate. Uh, so, I told you all as a result that I was um, engaged in a lot of research and a lot of study around early Christianity as a result of the debate. And this is part of my research. And so I will be doing a series of these videos in which I discuss um, early Christianity, some of the different understandings that different Christians had. Um, and so this is one. Uh, so in particular, and the, 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 the title of this report on early Christianity is what you'll see on every slide. Uh, this was just a thought that came to me. Those who defend the Nicene Creed are in essence defending the faith constructed by the Roman Empire. So the Nicene Creed in particular, um, the Council of Nicaea was called together by the Roman Emperor, uh, thus beginning the statement that um, Christianity became a Western religion. Christianity became a tool of the dominant religion. And so we'll get into that discussion later. Uh, for the moment, this should be a relatively quick video. There's not many slides I have on this. I'll have some more discussions on this, but for the most part, let's get into it. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today was is a specific particular gospel um, that is not in canon. Uh, it's called the Gospel of Peter. So it's um, not well known. Uh, but in the formative days of Christianity, it was widely read. And for our own historical purposes, at first, the only accounts could be found in the work of one of the church fathers in refutations. Apparently, these guys wrote thousands of pages against these different um, versions of Christianity that arose. And so one of the things that we have to do as well is trace um, those the tradition that became canon, you know, where, you know, we need to research these Orthodox uh, church fathers of the Western world. Uh, that would be a very interesting um, journey to see where they came from. So the history on it goes that a father named Sir Serapion was a bishop around 230, uh, visited a city, Rosas, which was a town that surrounded Antioch. So he had heard that the Christians there um, were worshiping in a certain way. So these were like, he was like a thought police. So uh, they, the church apparently was very interested in the appropriate way of worship. Um, and so when he was there, he hung out for a little bit and then didn't see that anything was wrong and then he went home. Uh, but apparently somebody was like, well, hey, wait up. You need to check them out. You know, this is the scripture that they have. And the scripture that they have claimed that it was written by uh, Simon Peter. Uh, and then he was has, asked to read it for himself and judge for himself uh, the validity of its contents. So then after reading it, he was like, whoa, wait a second. Uh, this cannot stand. I can't let these uh, Christians practice in this manner. And so he wrote against it. And the reason why he um, wrote against it was because within the pages of this gospel, there was uh, phrases that could be viewed as supporting a particular type of view, which is docetism. And docetism was a very, very popular view in early Christianity. Uh, because it was something that the Christians began to see made more sense than this wild stuff we have today that dominated. So, but then we have to ask ourselves, what particularly is docetism? So this was a view that claimed that Christ was at all times divine and not human. Thereby, it was denying his suffering. So in the Christological formula, Christ has to suffer in order to identify with the uh, human condition. Um, and so if you don't, if you take away the suffering of Christ, 
then it is what's the point of his crucifixion for these people but that's according to the orthodox view for the uh, docetists um christ was completely divine and could not be human because as god uh, the creator of all of the universe, the whole shebang, because it was said Christ was God. So how could God, the creator of all, come and suffer? And he could not have a human form. It's God. You know, because they, they rationally thought about this. This was a rational thought, you know, because it makes sense. How could, and this is what, in today's world, uh, many of us that turn away from the Orthodox Christian view, we begin to have these questions because that makes more sense. Like, how could the creator of all that exists come down as a human? Not understand. It doesn't really make sense. What makes more sense is that there was a likeness that he came down as. And, um, and that he came, there was a ghost or phantasm that came to show us the way um and but this was a problem well i already went over that um but there were several passages in this thing that uh, showed that that supported this view we'll move on to that later so this was one view of docetism then the second view which was really popular um jesus was a flesh and blood human but christ there was a christ consciousness who as God could not experience pain and suffering. This uh, Christ consciousness descended from heaven in the form of a dove at the baptism of Jesus and entered into him. This power entered Jesus and allowed him to do miraculous things and have a new teaching. This Christ then left Jesus at the crucifixion, hence the saying in Mark 15, verse 34, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if the divine element did not suffer and die, how could this death be any different from any other person? How could this death be redemptive? This was the problem for the church. Um, but we're going to see that this particular passage is uh, something that comes up over and over again in church history as we go on because it makes sense. The dove came and descended on Jesus. Why would Jesus start crying? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, who is he talking to? Is he talking to himself? This is, these are things that these early Christians began to really just rationally sit and think and look at. Like, okay, we want to adhere to this faith. Let's make it make sense to us. So here uh, we're going to go into the gospel a little bit. The gospel begins, none of the Jews washed their hands and neither did Herod or any of his judges. And since they did not wish to, Pilate stood up, Pontius Pilate, the Romans stood up and decided to wash his hands of the death of Jesus. And so here we have um, the blame being placed more on the Jews than on the Romans, uh, which played a part in, um, in the Christological view that was beginning to be developed that uh, were saying that the Romans began to inherit the true tradition of God from the Jews because the Jews are being the ones that crucify God. So, um, moving on. In another passage, says, Then the king Herod, the king of the Jews, said, Take him away and do everything I have told you to do to him. So in this gospel, it's the Jewish king and not the governor that orders Jesus' death. A statement that is of interest later on in this gospel says, that Jesus was silent, as if he had no pain throughout the whole thing. Um, and so when Seraphim read this, he was like, wait a second, like if you're human and you're suffering, you're crying because you feel the pain. But in this gospel, it said that Jesus was silent. And then, so if you're up there on the pro pit preaching and you're saying that some dude is suffering you know, he's being nailed to the cross, he's being whipped, he's got a horn, he's got this, this thing of thorns around his head, he's bleeding to death, and he's just chilling because there is no pain as God. The divine essence is the divine essence. If God feels the pain, that's because God at the same time feels joy. God is all that was, is, and ever shall be. Omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. You cannot harm 
that which has no harm to be is is you just can't harm God. Uh, I'll point blank. This is the whole confusion with the devil thing as well. Um, and so this was heretical part. This is what Seraphim had a problem with. So um, in this gospel as well, Jesus says at the crucifixion, "My power, O oh power, you have left me." He is then said to be take. He is then said to take up. Uh, he is then said to be taken up as his body is left on the cross. With this passage, we can see how it can be interpreted that Christ was a power that was bestowed upon the man Jesus and left upon his death. So this is going into like earlier are some other parts of Christianity that says that uh, Christ, you know, was a man, flesh and blood, born of Mary, seed of David or seed of Joseph, seed of David, because they try to trace Jesus's lineages to David and Adam. I think we see that in Mark and Matthew or Luke, or one of those Gospels. I'll get that straight in a second. Um, but because of his living such a beautific life, such a perfect life, the divine essence descended upon him. Um, this is semi-adoptionism, which was something that the church was fighting against in early Christianity as well. And so this was a heretical, this is why Seraphon said this was heretical. Uh, because at the same time, this is self-empowering. The practices that lead from this type of teaching can teach you that if you cultivate the divine, if you cultivate the self and the consciousness within yourself, the Christ consciousness can descend upon you. So we can also see early Gnostic teachings uh, here as well, which uh, in, the Gnostic, in the Gnostic understanding, you are the divine light trapped within the body. But as you identify with that light essence, uh, you can transcend the limitations of the body. So um, this is kind of another weird point uh, in because uh, uh, it gives more description of what happened at the tomb and like why it was empty. Because you know the account that I guess uh, is in the, is in scripture is that the sisters came to the tomb, the stone was rolled away, the body was gone. They're like, oh, he's gone. Um, but here it says. Uh, Matthew, Pilate sends guards to the tomb of Christ. In this gospel, however, we have more detail as to what happened. Here it says, in the night hours, the heaven opened up and two men descended into the tomb. The stone in the front of the tomb rolls away on its own. So like they use telekinesis and say, move before me. Um, they witnessed the two men walk into the tomb and then walk out with a third man. And this is what's really crazy. They said the head of the two men reach up, not look up, but reach up to the sky, while the head of the third man reaches beyond it. So it's like they're saying, they're talking about their height, like they're giants, like the Nephilim or something. And then they are followed by the cross. And the voice from heaven is in, is in heard asking the cross, have you preached to those who were asleep? And the cross replies, they have. And so then we have here, you know, some hidden teachings. We have some wild teachings as well. Um, I found out in reading um, another one of the church fathers uh, that, you know, it said that the people were giants. Um, in one of these early sects of Christians, uh, there was, uh, well, Epiphanius, Epiphanius, Epiphanius says of one of the Christian communities that they believe Christ was the brother of the Holy Spirit. And they, the Holy Spirit was a sister, Christ was the brother. They both had physical forms that were 96 feet in height. So this kind of correlates with that story. Although it's different, it doesn't come from the same gospel. This kind of is just another interesting correlating point that was on Christianity at that time. Now, the second view, the one where Christ descends from heaven and was bestowed on Jesus, it echoes the sentiments of uh, one of the earliest Christian communities, which was the Ebionites. Now, the Ebionites uh, were also called the Nazarenes, and there's speculation that they might have existed during our pre-Jewish wars. And so the Ebionites, they viewed Jesus as a Jew, who was a rabbi, who had attained a special understanding of the law, um, and was able to achieve a higher level of consciousness through his life. And so uh, they in particular kept the law like they were Jews. 
uh, that kept the law and then uh, strove to manifest higher consciousness within themselves. Um, so here's where this comes from. Uh, I think this is the gospel itself. And so let me just read it for you so you can understand it. After the people were baptized, Jesus also came and was baptized by John. And as he came up from the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Holy Ghost in the likeness of a dove that descended and entered into him. This was the gospel uh, that the Ugonites used. And a voice from heaven saying, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. And again, this day I have begotten thee. So it was on this day that Christ, that he became Jesus, the Christ. The Christ consciousness came unto him. Um, and straightway there shall there shone about the place a great light, which when John saw it, said unto him, Who art thou, Lord? And again, there was a voice from heaven saying unto him, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And then it saith, John fell down before him and said, I beseech thee, Lord, baptize thou me. But he prevented him, saying, Suffer it, for thus suffer it or let it go. For thus it behoveth that all things should be fulfilled. All right. And on this account, they say Jesus was begotten of the seed of man and was chosen. So Jesus, because of his works, because of his effort, was able to receive the Christ consciousness. And so by the choice of God, he was called the son of God from the Christ that came into him and from above in the likeness of a dove. And they deny that he was begotten of God the Father, but say that he was created as one of the archangels. Yet greater in that he is the Lord of the angels and all things made by the Almighty. My Almighty, and that he came and taught as the gospel current among them contains that I came to destroy the sacrifices, and if you cease not from sacrificing, the wrath of God will not cease from you. This is kind of relating to some of the works of Pliny. Apparently, Pliny wrote about an archangel that was the first begotten of the Lord, did God's work and things of this nature. We'll explore that a little later. Um, but so. On this account, they say that Jesus was begotten of the seed of a man and was chosen. And so by the choice of God, he was called the son of God from the Christ that came into him from above in the likeness of a dove. So, um, yeah, I think I already read this part. So that was the gospel of Peter. It was really widespread in early Christianity before the church fathers got uh, state backing was able to stamp this part out um and so it makes you wonder like what would have happened or what how would the world have looked the western world in particular if this if the communities which preached alternative understandings of the gospels got together that is quite interesting i bet you would have had uh, a totally different environment I wonder if the dark age would have ensued because of that. But anyway, that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Peace and blessings.